you happy? Can you hear? Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of uh, the PBR TV live sessions with Paul Glatzel from Powerboat Training UK. Today, we're talking all about charts and tides, um, going a little bit more in depth into uh, practical boating and uh, furthering our tuition sessions as we're all under the COVID-19 um, lockdown. So to keep boating alive, we're continuing to do these episodes each week. And this evening, we thought we'd, we would try with um, doing a 7 p.m. evening slot. So, um, Paul, welcome again. Thank you for joining us again for this evening. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure to be here. Okay. So um, do, you, do you want to go through sort of the, the sort of things that we're going to cover off on this evening? Yeah, we thought tonight we'd um, just have maybe a bit of a refresher for some, uh, maybe something new for others. Um, and I'd like to think even for uh, those that have got a fair bit of experience, we might even be able to sneak in a top tip or a, uh, a little learning point that maybe you've actually uh, not come across before. So we're just going to touch on charts and tides. We're not going to go into enormous detail, um, but we're just going to have a chat over a bit of background to them. And quite obviously, that's going to include the chart plots at electronic side of things as well. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, essentially people may be new to boating or they, they've got a, a new uh, uh, electronic chart plotter. They may have not used charts particularly uh, at all. So, yeah, it'd be great to cover up on some of these things. Um, especially also, it's really useful having a refresher, isn't it? Especially when we use only maybe one electronic device. It's um, it's good to, yeah, look back through. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, do you want to kick things off with um, admiralty charts? Obviously, they are um, un underpin um, all paper charts sort of un underpin the electronic versions. So um, I thought we'll yeah start with admir admiralty charts. Yeah, so we uh, I was trying to be slightly different on this, and we should hopefully have some uh, screens coming up um, as as we're talking. So uh, admiralty charts um, really underpin everything. Uh, the Admiralty UK Hydrographic Office. Um, get the base data um, that forms charts, and for years it's been Admiralty. There are other providers now. Um, the reality is, um, in the small boat world, um, you don't tend to find too many Admiralty charts on boats, um, simply because the format they come in, which is generally fairly large, paper that doesn't survive getting wet, isn't really conducive to the sort of world that most of us operate in in the smaller boats. The Admiralty did a, a pack called a Tough Chart for a while, which was sort of pretty thick plastic and it was awesome, but uh, just simply not enough of us uh, uh, bore them. So they don't actually have them anymore. But if you're looking at the Admiralty chart at the moment, you'll see the colors um, on there and just keep that at the back of your mind as we go on to the next one. Yeah, good. So if do you want to share then that first slide. Yeah, we'll um, maybe jump on to uh, to the second one actually with the Imray uh, one there, Tom, would be great. Okay, cool, we have that up now. Okay, so you're looking uh, at an IMRO chart, and, and what you're seeing is, is Paul Harbour, um, and the one before that uh, didn't come up, the Admiralty one, was exactly the same. And the only difference between the two is, is the colours. Um, and what you're looking at um, on the IMRO chart um, is basically um, some, some inf loads of information. We'll come back to that in a moment, and we're going to drill down into a bit more detail. Um, about what we're actually looking at. But you're looking at the same base data, the same numbers, the same depth information. Uh, but IMRE has been constructed really to, to support smaller boats, and therefore a lot of the information is about the smaller boat bits, slipways, uh, marinas, fuel stations, rather than uh, the big ship side of things, which is historically where the Admiralty came from. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, I think, why the... Imray chart is more popular, but I think you've kind of <laughs> answered that there a little bit. So, yeah, what, what are we kind of looking at there um, on, the, on that slide of the Imray? So we can see that we've got uh, uh, Paul Harbour. 
Yeah, so we're going to we're going to drill down onto that in a moment, um, and we've got a screen that comes up um, in a couple of slides where we're going to have a look uh, in a bit, bit more detail about the information that you're actually getting up there in terms of uh, Paul Harbour. But yeah, Tom Tom raised the question as to you know why is Imray that much more popular, and to a large extent, it comes down to its durability. Um, they're made of plasticized paper, uh, so you can literally put it put it in the bath, soak it overnight, bring it back out, put it on the radiator, and it's going to work fine. Um, and that's that's a really key thing when you've got uh, a small boat that's quite often quite often damp. And in a training environment, we give our in-road charts a, a, a good battering, um, and they do last a, a good amount of time. Um, and the reason it's important for us to bring out the Admiralty and the in -ray, you know, we're all operating on chart plotters now. Um, that's the, the the accepted means of primary means of navigation is electronic nav. But the the reality is these paper charts. Um, Admiralty and Imre, they underpin the chart plotters that we all love using. Um, and as we come on to, maybe if we can bring the next slide up. Um, yeah, the the uh, Navionics for the electronic versions. Yeah, so basically Navionics charts come in a couple of different forms. Um, great uh, iPad app. Uh, so I've had that for quite a few years now. It's come on leaps and bounds. But you also find Navionics charts in uh, Raymarine chart plotters, uh, Navionics itself is now owned by Garmin, so you're getting them in Garmin. Um, and it's, it really is the sort of the go-to package. Um, and one of the great things um, about the Navionics app on your iPad is you can actually link uh, your iPad to your chart plotter, um, and you can look at your charts, uh, do some work on their prepare passages. You walk onto your boat, switch your chart plotter on, um, and the two link to each other and transfer the work you've done onto the boat. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool. And when uh, you know we've mentioned a couple of times around Ireland, that's how we did it going around Ireland. We did all the work on the iPad, and it automatically transferred itself into into the main uh, chart plotter, which was really awesome. But you notice if you're looking at the the Navionics screen now, you'll see actually there is slightly less detail on it. It's not to say that detail is not there, but the thing you've got to bear in mind is with Imray and the Admiralty. Um, those charts are effectively a photograph. Um, they're what we call raster charts, which is basically a photograph, um, a, a printed image with all the data there. And your brain is the thing that does the scrolling in and out. Um, and all the numbers are there. They don't disappear if you scroll out or get um, more detailed if you scroll in. Whereas on Navionics, it's all about scrolling in and out to see more information or clicking on things to bring up other bits of information. So it's just a different way of actually doing it. But it means you've got to be slightly careful because it means that you might not be looking scrolled in enough to see all the data. And there's a classic example of that from the navigation. I think it's one of the around the world race yachts going across the Pacific, um, went to ground on an atoll and it was because they did their planning, scrolled out, didn't see this island effectively and went straight into it. Um, so Navionics are uh, going to come on to as well in a bit more uh, detail. So we've got Admiralty and Imray, the paper charts, uh, Imray really preferred for small boats, but both of them are effectively what you need to understand to be able to make sense of what's in the Navionics chart. And we're going to look in, in a bit more detail at the Imray chart in a moment to, to drill down on that. Okay, yeah, great. So, I mean, um, I think the Navionics one, the, the app is, is so useful also where um, you can um, have it as a as the perfect backup, can't you? You can even just have it on a small iPhone. So um, making sure that you've got those uh, different tiers of safety nets that you were talking about last week. Uh, I think we mentioned the Navionics app as a, as a perfect tool within that, as well as having your normal plotters, etc., on board the boat. Um, yeah, absolutely. So just as you were saying, it's that multi-layered approach. It's not, it's not about relying on one thing. It's about having lots of things. So if you lose one, the chart goes overboard or the electronics go down. You've always got something else there. Um, so you've got something to support you. Hmm. So um, should we start with our next slide, which uh, talks about the different scale charts? Yeah, so we've got uh, basically a little screen grab we did earlier here from uh, an iPad. Um, and if it's either playing or it's about to play, uh, what you'll see is you'll see we're seeing an area from the Isle of Wight to Portland. And, and we're seeing some numbers, we're seeing some different colours. And you can see Paul Harbour with that uh, purple line around it. As so we're scrolling in, this is um, Imray charts basically on an iPad. You can see much more detail um, actually becomes obvious. And effectively, what it's doing is, is it's loading um, the alternative, the, the more detailed 
uh, charts for Paul. And, and that's basically different scales. If we were scrolled out to look at uh, Portland to the Isle of Wight, it uh, gives us a great amount of information for navigating between those two places, but would we want to go into Paul Harbour with that very limited amount of information? Well, of course we wouldn't. So we basically need a different scale chart that gives us the data to go in and out of Paul Harbour. Um, it's not to say that people don't go in and out of Paul Harbour without, uh, without the chart, but that's not to say it's good practice either. So, uh, so you can see as you scroll in there, you get lots, lots more information. And if we move on to the next slide now, then it's a, a static slide and it's just got the information uh, that's now um, appearing on the screen. So if I just get my chart out at the same time. Um, so if we can bring up the next uh, charts. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm showing the Paul Harbour. With the middle yeah, so chart, uh, chart number six, so that's the slide I think we've got. So we've got basically um, a snapshot um, of the Central Harbour. And the way I think of a chart is, um, and a good way to, to explain it to yourself, is think of it as the worst case situation. So imagine we push the tide down to the lowest level it ever gets to, and we took a photo. Then the chart is that photo, and it's showing us what we're going to see when the water's at its lowest. And that lowest we call lowest astronomical tide, and that reference level becomes called chart datum, CD or chart datum. And you're looking at that chart now, and you're seeing green. Well, on an in-ray, green is always land. Um, and that's pretty, pretty obvious, I suppose. Um, you'll see darker blue, lighter blue, and then white. And the darker blue is deeper water coming through to the white, which is shallower water. So you've got that, the colors indicating the progression. Um, the yellow bits are what we call areas that dry, um, drying heights, and they're areas that at that lowest astronomical tide are exposed. And one of the mistakes and the misunderstandings people have is they think the areas in yellow are going to be exposed at low tide. Not necessarily. It's they, They'll only all be exposed at the lowest astronomical tide, and then it really depends on what the tidal level, what the tidal height is, as to whether they'll actually be exposed that particular tide. So we're going to come on to that in a moment and have a look at that. You'll see in the white area, sort of in the middle of the screen, um, we've got an area, and you'll see a, an area called middle mud, and above that you've got some numbers, um, 07, 08, and that means 0.7 and 0.8. Is it feet, is it meters? Well, you have to look at the charts on really current charts around the UK, it's always meters. Uh, but I've boated in Caribbean America and it catches you up because it's in feet um, or even sometimes in fathoms uh, where a fathom is six foot. Uh, so that area around middle mud um, is minimum depth of water ever because it's in white, it's always water. Um, that minimum level is 0.7 metres or 0.8, that little bit up just to just above it to the right. So that's the minimum depth. And what we need to do, and we'll come on to tide, is we bring along our tidal height for that point in time, and we add it to that number, and we'll come to that in a moment. If you notice in any of the yellow areas, what do you notice that's different about that yellow area? Well, it's a zero um, with a little, well, it's a zero or one or two, with a little underline and then a little subscript uh, number, and, and then think of it as sort of minus um, 0.7 or 0.2, and that's basically proud above that minimum level that lowest astronomical tide. So you've got bits that are always water and you've got bits that are exposed um, at that lowest astronomical tide. And the colors can vary, chart manufacturer to my chart manufacturer, you go to the meds, you buy a chart, the colors might be different, but the principles are all the same. Um, and a lot of charts around the world are created from Admiralty charts simply because we over the years as a country have gone off and, and done that sort of charting stuff. And then you look around the rest of the chart, there's just tons of information. So if you go sort of uh, up to the sort of two o'clock position from middle mud until it hits the shore and you'll see an area that says recreation grounds. Um, and it's got um, a little picture of a boat and it's got a little um, triangular shape. Um, and if you were to look on the back of a chart or on the key that comes with your chart, you see that means a slipway. Um, so it's highlighting there a slipway and there's a little slipway that comes across an area that dries. So there's a question to me, am I always going to be able to launch there? Well, that's going to depend on the tide, isn't it? And then I go to the left of that and I've got marina and it's implying um, that maybe V for visitor um, and it's um, telling you uh, other other things exist there that might be useful to you in a marina. And as you go around the chart, there's just tons of information. And 
you know, if you end up being a bit, a bit of a geek like me and most instructors actually are, you'll end up being fascinated by the information you actually got on the chart. Um, and what a chart is there to do is to help you move from A to B safely. Um, and it's about knowing where you can go into the water, where you can launch, can you get safely along a channel, and can you then do what you want to when you get there? Can you water ski? Uh, can you anchor? Can you do whatever it is you want to do? And a chart gives you that information to be able to do it. Great. And um, I think we've, we've had a couple of questions here while we're talking about charts before we move on to the, the next uh, section. Um, somebody's asked what the thoughts are on CMAP. I, and there are obviously just, there's not just Navionics, there are other brands. I would say personally from my experience that um, uh, all of the manufacturers are updating constantly to give the, the best information that they can. Have you got much experience with, with CMAP, Paul? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, as you say, they all do a job. And I think it's like many things in life. You know, there's well, pretty much every car out there gets you from A to B, but some cars are better than others and some you enjoy driving and some less so. Uh, personally, you know, the Navionics just works for me. I like its interoperability interoperability uh, between chart plotters and the iPad app um, and CMAPs you know progressed on over the last few years I wouldn't say really it's cutting edge in the way that Navionics is but if I got onto a boat and it had CMAP and I needed to navigate from A to B it's going to do the job you know without question at the end of the day it's about you as the skipper of that boat as the person responsible for navigating using the tools you've actually got um, and it's absolutely able to do a job yeah, and I think, um, like you say, it's personal, uh, personal pre preference. Just uh, you sort of pick your poison and you choose which one you want to go for. And I think there are people that I've met that are CMAP through and through, and there are people that are Navionics. Um, what I can say, like we've chatted about with the um, with the phone app, is the accessibility of Navionics is a great uh, tool. Um, and that both of these manufacturers, as long as you've made sure that they are completely up to date, um, because that is one thing that's really important. A lot of these uh, um, software upgrades are happening every six months, even less than sometimes with the manufacturers wanting to give their customers the best product. So make sure that your your uh, chart plotter is completely up to date and obviously that the cards uh, likewise are. So we're going to... That's, yeah. that's actually a really great point, Tom. And, and then the great thing is it's much easier to do that now. You know, in the olden days, when the olden days was only two or three years ago, to update your chart um, in your chart plot, you had to take the little chip out, go down to the chandlers, and they'd either sell you a new one or whatever. Nowadays, uh, the chart plotter I've got just to my left here, um, then you hook it up to your phone, or even potentially it has a little 4G card in it, or it connects to Wi-Fi, and it automatically updates itself. So with things like Navionics, uh, you generally buy nowadays in Garmin, uh, you buy lifetime map subscriptions and they just keep updating. And it's connectivity to Wi-Fi or to your mobile phone by pairing means that there's no excuse for not keeping it up to date. And it is important because uh, boys move, uh, sandbars move, um, things change. And if you navigate into a port or harbour and you rely on information that's five, six years old and something's changed and you go aground, then you can be uh, digging yourself a very big hole as a product of that. Yeah, and we're going to be going through rogue data as well, which I think comes into that as well, where, yeah, something may have updated something that previously wasn't shown on the chart. So um, we'll, we'll delve a little bit deeper into that. Um, do you want us to move on to tides? Yeah, let's, uh, let's move on to tides. So we're try trying to keep this sort of dead simple. You know, we, we haven't gone through the voyage or necessarily all the objects on the chart. And one thing I'd like to think came of the chart session is I'd really like to think that people would actually go, yeah, let's just go and buy a chart. Let's just have a look at it. Whether it's Navionix or it's an Imre chart, um, just maybe buy one and have a look at it. And you'll be fascinated by how much information is actually on it. And at the end of the day, boating in the leisure world should be all about enjoyment. And if that knowledge, um, and that research on your part allows you to go different and better places. Well, that's just more fun, isn't it? But you can't use the chart unless you know the tides. Um, so the two have to go hand in hand, which is why we've married these two sections together. So. Yeah, and I think it's, it's important that when boating, especially with the, the, the latest modern tech, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, auto routing and things like that, that, that is, is built into many of the manufacturer software these days. Um, but it can also cause a little bit of complacency and just sort of 
staring at your screen. Um, whereas, yeah, being familiar with charts, I know I, d I don't do enough chart work and then I get out a paper chart every couple of years and look at it blankly for a few minutes. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so if somebody's wanting to do um, a bit of a refresher and, and, and learn properly about chart work, um, is there an RWA course that really focuses in on chart work? Yeah, I mean, you use two words there, and they, they arguably lead to two different courses. A little bit of a refresher at a powerboat level two type level, taking your skills onto high level. Uh, the online essential navigation and seamanship course, really awesome course. Um, yeah, I always had that for a few years. Used to be solely in a classroom, now tends to be more online. There are loads of centres out there offering uh, the online course, and quite obviously over the last few weeks, months, many, many people have done that. If you really want to nail it in terms of your knowledge of charts, tides, voyage, collision regs, uh, boats, and so on, the Day Skipper online course is, is perfect. You can do it in a classroom for five days, you can do it online, and it's equivalent to five days, and that's an awesome course. Uh, uh, it's interesting, one of the problems we have with, if I say persuading people to do that, is generally their lack of availability, their lack of time. The great thing over the last few months is time hasn't been a great issue, so we've seen huge upsurge as many RA schools have in people doing the day skipper course and they really won't regret it. It's not to say that every day of the week they go boating, they use every bit of that course, but it gives them the knowledge to make educated decisions as to whether they need to look at something in more detail or they can put it to one side. So they're, they're well worth looking at. Good, okay. So in our tide section, we're gonna be looking at um, springs, neeps, the comparison and ranges, um, sources of tidal information, um, delving back into Navionics and how that um, can help us with our tide, tide information um, and uh, some other sort of top tips at the end. Um, do you want me to start things off by showing the um, uh, spring tides um, slide? Yeah, if we bring up, we've got a little image um, of spring tides now. So let's do a straw poll amongst those watching and uh, we can't see you, but uh, if, if you think spring tides happen in March and April, uh, hold your hand up um, or maybe put it behind the sofa but you won't be alone in thinking that I think we all did in fairness before we knew um, a little bit more but uh, we've got um, hopefully an image up on the screen now of a spring tides and basically when the sun the moon and the earth let's put this shot down all pull together as one then basically what we do is we get higher highs and lower low and we get the biggest range um, and the range is between that Highest high, lowest low, and that's the, the spring range as you should be able to see on the image. Um, and we get spring tides, not every March and April, we get it every two weeks because it's part of that 28 day uh, cycle. Um, so we have a spring tide, as we'll come on to in a moment, then we have a neat tide seven days later, and then we have a spring tide seven days later, and a neat tide. And between those seven day points, it's sort of graduating between the two. Now I'm going to throw Tom a question here. Um, I seem to remember you're quite partial to boating in uh, Salkham, Tom. Um, yeah. do you, when you go down there, when is it you get the biggest tide? So if you, you think of the biggest tides being spring tides, what time of the day roughly are um, the, the lowest lows and the highest highs that you experience? Um, yeah, oh, you, um, I would say that, uh, yeah, it's the answer would be, yeah, lows early afternoon, um, well, highs early evening. Yeah, spot on. Um, I can't say I know that off the top of my head. I checked out uh, before I came online and uh, figured your, as it was your sort of local playground, then you'd know. But the interesting thing there, and this is one of these sort of, like, hopefully these little snippets you'll come out with, um, and maybe you know this, maybe you don't, Tom, but those on spring tides, and spring tides are when we see full, new, full moons or new moons. So if we walk out and we see a full moon or a new moon, we know we're on spring tides, and therefore... High water will always be early evening in Salkham on a spring tide, and low water will always be early afternoon on a spring tide. So conversely, you're going to be able to work out roughly when the neaps are, um, and you're going to know, you walk out, you see full moon, spring tides, it's going to be high water about 6, 7 o'clock tonight in Salkham. Um, and that's, it's not the same time in every place around the world, um, but the time that springs occur will be the same. Um, every two weeks in that place. Plus or minus Pool Harbour, uh, we get our highest spring tides uh, late morning, so in the sort of 10.30 through to 12 uh, range. And then we've got unusual tides here. It stands the whole day, 
And then 4.30, someone pulls the plug out and everything goes out the harbour. Um, and it races down to low water, 6 o'clock, which is why here in Poole, the lifeboat does most of its shouts late evening, uh, sorry, early evening, because if someone's pulled the plug out, all the water's gone out and everybody's got the ground uh, coming back into the harbour, getting caught out in the shallow water. So think of your own boating location and, and work out uh, when those times are. So springs, highest highs, lowest lows. And if we're able to move on to the next image uh, to show neeps, um, then the image you should see with neeps is not quite as high, not quite as low. So if that's the spring range, that's the neap range. And if you look at the relationship between the two, the spring range is about twice the neap range. Um, and that's, that's important because what you're able to then say with the spring tides, so if it's going to go from there to there, we're going to move that volume of water. Um, if it's going to go from there to there, it's about half the volume. So therefore, when we get into the horizontal flow of water, then on spring tides, the horizontal flow of water will be about twice the rate of flow that we get on uh, neap tides. And if you look at that in the, the places you can get that information, you'll see that relationship is almost perfectly numerical uh, two to one. So neap tides, seven days later spring tides, seven days later uh, which we never were, and we had neap tides, spring tides, and so on. Great. Okay. So, um, moving on from uh, NEEPs, uh, we've got obviously the comparison of ranges that would uh, flow between what we've been talking about uh, currently. Um, I'm showing the slide here, um, which gives a, uh, the NEEP range and our spring range and our obviously our, our depth of water. Can you um, explain a little bit about what people are seeing here? Yes, yeah, so you can see very visually now, we're looking at that sort of like a, a cutaway profile. And there's a very commonly used image uh, in our way training. And we can see our spring range and our neat range, and we can see that relationship between the two. We can see a lighthouse and we can see uh, a bridge. Um, and there's some terminology there um, that you'll see on charts and people will use like mean low water neaps, mean high water neaps, meaning average high water and low water neaps. Um, mean high water springs and mean high water springs is a number that's used in so far as certain heights are referenced so the height of a uh, lighthouse uh, light will be referenced to mean high water springs we then have something called we had lowest astronomical tide down at chart datum and we have highest astronomical tide right up the top which is then um, the clearance on that bridge is referenced to hat or highest astronomical tide. And why is that important? Well, ironically here in Paul, we've got two bridges um, and you can't always get under them. So what you can actually do is you can look at the data and say, well, hat is 1.6 meters for one of the bridges. So the minimum clearance I'm ever gonna get is 1.6. My boat needs two meters. So I need the tide to be 0.4 below hat to get under that bridge. Um, so you're gonna be able to, to use that information to achieve that objective. So yeah, I, I think uh, where we go on to yeah, talk about how we use that tidal information, I, I've, I've seen many people get caught out uh, coming up underneath bridges and uh, not be sort of uh, too experienced in their local knowledge. And I think it's, yeah, it's really important to understand um, these different types of comparison ranges and um, get, get to know your tides. We, um, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about the, um, different sources of tidal information. Do you want me to um, show the, the following yeah, so if we, yeah, if we could get that uh, image up on the screen and it shows uh, some of the sources. It, it's interesting to, to think back to when we first started teaching level two and um, we would use something called an almanac and a tidal curve and we would have to calculate mm. um, what the tidal height was during the day. Um, and nothing wrong with that, and, and almanacs um, still have their place. But the reality is nowadays, um, there are a lot of electronic and simpler methods of actually getting tidal information. So on the screen, um, you've got um, something called Easy Tide. Um, so that's a, a hydrographic office, completely free products that you can get on the internet, and it will give you tides for pretty much anywhere in the UK up to seven days forward, and you can adjust for British summer time. Um, so there's absolutely no excuse for not having tidal information a day or two before you go boating. So you're going to know what the tides are, so you can't, so you can prevent yourself getting caught out. 
And then one of the other images on that screen also uh, is a printed uh, document, and it comes from one of these uh, tidal planners, uh, which we have around the South Coast and there are other places around the UK, and it's got that more sort of uh, visual representation of tidal bites. And that's just a very simple curve on a week by week basis. And you can just read along time, date, um, height, um, and lift the tidal height off, uh, read the tidal height at that point in time. Uh, the app I tend to use for tidal height information is Imray uh, Tides Planner. Um, it's free and it gives you, I think, the next day, or you pay something like three pounds to get the whole of the UK for the whole of the year and it will work on your phone and your iPad at the same time. So I tend to buy that each year now. Um, sometimes in fact, it's a little, it's not always perfectly straightforward in terms of using it. Um, I don't find it perfectly intuitive, but it's giving good information. You've got to be quite careful with some of the apps. And a good way of checking whether they're any good um, is to look at uh, the tidal information they give you for Pool Harbour. Uh, because the tidal curve for Pool Harbour goes up and down, up again, and then down. Um, and I've seen a few apps where they show Paul Harbour as just a straightforward curve. And if it's showing you that, it's rubbish. Um, don't buy it. <laughs> good, good top tip. Um, so do you want to go into a little bit more about the Navionics side and how, obviously, it's the most popular app on people's phones, um, how um, it gives that information. But uh, I think we've got it on the slide there. We've put your... your the, uh, the paper version and the Imray. Yeah. In the top top right here, we've got the uh, Navionics, haven't we, where you can highlight. Yeah, we've got Navionics. And the next, um, the next slide we've got is actually a little video uh, clip again. So if we could uh, bring that up. And that's Navionics. And Navionics is a bit of a game changer um, in this respect um, because it gives you tidal information in two respects. It gives you tidal height it going up and down and we'll see that happening in a moment so you can see right where the cursor is um and yes yeah, so you can see basically i've clicked on where that cursor was in a moment i'm scrolling left and right and you can see that box and the curve at the bottom and it's showing that tidal information where it's a real game changer though is here what we're showing is there's an arrow we've clicked on that arrow on navionics and then if we're able to play that bit um, we'll see that I can scroll my finger left and right, and you can see the direction and the rate of tide being represented in that little arrow. So why is that a game changer? Well, uh, tidal height information uh, from the little printed booklets is pretty easy to get, um, and it's easy to get on an app. But the reason this is a game changer, if you think of us coming out of Pool Harbour or anywhere and just going around a headland. We could go around that headland in the morning, and actually here we're going off to Portland, and you can see all those arrows of tide here. Uh, so it's showing you just a different place. And we'll click on one of those in a moment, um, and it will show you um, how we bring that up. So you can see landing the cursor on that red arrow, um, and then in a moment that will scroll left and right and just show you that same tide information. Um, so we could go out in the morning, could be zero wind. Uh, we go around the headland into the next bay, um, we've got kids on board, people who are maybe not quite as confident with their boating as we are. Um, and then we come back a few hours later, and around that headland, it's really kicked up. Um, and it's kicked up not because there's any wind, but because there's flow of tide. And generally around a headland, um, you have, looking there at Portland, to the left-hand side of that, you'll have really deep water. And then it will be shallow due south of that headland. And then it will be deep to the right. So basically, as that water comes, flows around that headland, it's got nowhere to go. You can't compress water. So it basically goes up and it creates standing waves in the area of that shallow water. So you've gone around, no wind. Um, you think it's going to be absolutely fabulous later. Come back around later on with zero wind. Suddenly, you've got some really quite challenging conditions. And if you add in wind into that as well, and tide and wind are going in the opposite directions, then the seas can kick up further. Um, and aside from being dangerous, uh, potentially, uh, there's a lot of families just get completely put off, uh, scared, and just not want to go boating again. And that's just not in anyone's interest. Uh, so our ability to predict what tide is doing around the headland uh, is really key. Now, that's quite a complex, uh, it's not a dead simple thing to do in a traditional way using an almanac. It's dead simple to use Navionics. And you'll find what we're looking at on Navionics here for the tidal height 
um, and the tidal stream information is exactly the same nowadays in chart plotters. Even actually the Imray chart program I've got on my iPad, which is using paper charts, has these tidal stream bits of information and tidal height overlaid onto the paper chart, so we can do exactly the same. So that is, a, for me, that's a real game changer because it makes tidal stream information really easy for people to get to. So they can say, I've gone around at 10 in the morning, when is it safe to come back round again? When is the tide flowing at its least around that headland? Yeah, one of the um, uh, that, that I really um, like as well is uh, um, they all have their own version. The, the version I'm most familiar with, the, the Simrad unit, has um, a, a trip intel, and it will tell you all the different uh, details of your trip. But you can overlay that information, you can export it, but you can also then look yeah, with the tidal information that's built into the, um, the Simrad unit, the same as um, the other competitors. Um, but it gives you so much more data, doesn't it, on your, your on your planning. Um, and uh, like you say, it's, it's got to be enjoyable. You can, um, yeah, you, you don't want to, even boating in the solar can become quite nasty. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, no, that's so it's really useful tools, um, harnessing modern technology to obviously maximize your boating and um, at the same time stay safe and gain more knowledge. Um, how accurate, though, is your position on a chart potter? We're going to talk about um, some top tips in a minute. We've obviously been yeah. talking about our electronic uh, versions here and how that helps with the, with the tides. So sh should we move on to our top, uh, on to our top tips? Yeah, so we've, we've got a little image um, that will come up in a moment that's taken out of uh, one of the RYA books. And um, it's an interesting one. The, the statistic I'm given on uh, chart plotters GPS units is that our chart plotter is accurate, or a GPS unit is accurate, to 15 meters 95% of the time. And I've checked that statistic out with a few people who know far more than I do about this sort of thing. And seemingly that's that's pretty spot on. So 15 meters is pretty damn accurate. Um, the question is, uh, what about that 5%? How inaccurate is it five, about 5% of the time? And it could be 16 meters, or it could be 600 meters. You, How do we know? And when we're out there in a big expanse of water, how can we tell whether the information we've been given is, is accurate. Well, if it's a big wide area of water and there's no issues as to depth, I'm not sure it really matters even if it's 500 meters. But one of the things that people use chart plotters for is to navigate in and out of ports and harbors. So along narrow channels where either side there might be rocks or sandbanks or whatever, i.e. somewhere they can't go and they're gonna get into trouble. Now, if the width of that channel is 100 meters or 50 meters, then what's the chances their chart plotter could error and suddenly accidentally let them go outside that channel and therefore get into trouble? And, and a good way to think about this is linking to the image you've got on the screen in front. Um, I'm sure the vast majority of us have experienced of sat navs in cars. And I'm sure, Tom, you, you live out in the country. I'm sure you've been driving along a country road and you're dead central on the country road and then your car is in the adjacent field. Uh, on the sat nav all the time and anywhere in Devon it's unreliable <laughs> absolutely so at that point I imagine you probably don't go oh I'm not on the road anymore I must turn right to get back on it because you've got the visual indicator in front of you of the road when we're out on the boat that visual indicator is not at all not as obvious it could be if we're directly adjacent to um, some boy uh, or some object that we we know what it is but let's imagine a situation you might have two boys half a mile a mile apart um, and maybe the visibility's uh, a little compromised. Um, we're therefore right dead between them. And suddenly it shows us 300 meters out to the left in an area where we're about to go aground. We're far more likely in that situation because we don't have that obvious reference near to hand. So go, I must turn hard right and get back into the channel. But the effect of that is to take us out the other side of the channel and we go aground. And therefore it's not to say we mustn't use chart plotters. Um, but we just need to bear in mind that, that potential for error. Um, and it can be more profound on our phones and our iPads, because if you think of our car sat nav systems and our chart plotters, they're designed to do a job. Uh, they've got generally a sort of pretty swanky GPS 
element in there, whereas our phones are trying to do so many different things, and our iPads are as well, that they're more likely to error than a dedicated unit. Um, they don't error all the time, but SOD's law says they error when you can least afford it. And you, I think I'm correct in thinking that also it's they don't actually have a legal requirement to uh, be legally, legally accurate, these uh, electronic versions rather than paper charts. Yeah, so so you've got an issue there in terms of the accuracy of charts, insofar as the Imre the Admiralty charts are legally required to be accurate. Um, if you've ever booted up a chart plotter, I'm sure you've sort of come to that screen where you agree all these terms, conditions of business, as it were, um, and one of them goes, I promise not to use it for navigation. And you press OK and then use it for navigation. Um, and the the, the organisation doing that is doing that because they don't actually have to get it right. And we've got um, a little uh, video in a moment, so I'm sort of trying to think which one it actually is, um, which we'll come on to a moment, which shows that sort of error. Uh, but you might, on a chart plot, to get charting errors as well, where the chart is not exactly in the right place. And I've seen images where um, a cruise ship is right alongside a jetty, but the chart is showing 300 meters away, and that can only be as a product of electronic charting error. So GPS accuracy, generally very good, but just bear in mind it can go wrong. Yeah, I think uh, I've had it where I've been um, going across uh, Pool Bay, and it's, it's um, I've been already rounding Anvil Point, and it's still got me up sort of towards the needles. Um, so these things can happen. Um, I, would, I would also say, again, going back to the... Um, uh, the updating um, uh, setup, but um, you don't want to do anything. So, firstly, obviously, to make sure that your charts are up to date before you've left the marina, um, because I've had them where um, you're then trying to use the screen, and it's got different messages saying, "Do you want to do a software update and stuff?" Right, mm -hmm. where you want to try and look at it. Um, the other thing is, like you say, where you have clearly an error on the screen, but what is in front of you looks looks, looks different. If you are uh, concerned or, or, or have a query, don't do anything in, in haste. Um, slow the boat down and, and act calmly. And otherwise, as you say, you know, going hard to starboard or something could, could cause a, a, a knock-on accident, couldn't it? Absolutely. I see it's um, on courses or, you know, NITEX is somewhere where people get a little bit at sixes and sevens. They're not quite sure where they are. And they're starting to actually look at their chart and to assess it and so on. But they don't stop the boat somewhere safe. And they were actually probably in quite a safe place. But then the next two minutes, they carry on progressing at 6, 10, 12 knots. And that's when they go aground. If you're unsure, stop, make sure you're safe, hold station, position fix, work it out, and then move on. Don't guess. Yeah. So, um Moving on from our, our next tip, we want to talk a little bit about how useful sonar charts are. Um, shall I um, screen share um, this video, which uh, shows this? Yeah, please do. Um, so sonar chart was something um, I came across a few years ago now on uh, Navionics, and it's quite a clever little feature. It's not for everybody. Um, but basically, we've got an area of of um, first narrows there leading into, and you can see suddenly we just added loads of lines. And basically, there's a setting in Navionics, which is called Sonar Chart, which allows us to switch these lines off and on. And they're basically additional contour lines. Now, question, why, why is that important? Why is it useful? Why is it beneficial? And you can see here we're actually just switching on some, some other features on Navionics as well, some of which are of debatable benefit. I have to be honest, I'm never convinced by satellite overlay uh, just because you get too much information. Um, um, sonar Chart, why is, why is that useful? So. Um, basically, the way it works is it's effectively crowdsourcing of depth information. So if you've got a Garmin or a Raymarine unit that's running Navionics uh, software um, and you've got a Navionics account and you've linked your iPad or your phone to it, um, then potentially you've given permission for Navionics to hoover up the data from your depth gauge. So as you're driving around this area, um, and obviously in the Solent, a lot of boats uh, drive around that particular area, they're basically measuring the depth in that point. And then they're updating it to Navionics, and Navionics is giving it back to you in the form of sonar chart. Is it useful? Well, I'm not sure it's particularly useful there, if I'm honest, entering um, Hearst Narrows. But you go some places in the country where 
Uh, I mean, one I one I used it for was on Lake Wyndham. Uh, so Lake Wyndham is not properly charted, um, and you can actually um, switch sonar chart on for Lake Wyndham or Alton Broad, um, where again the charting uh, is quite limited, and potentially other places in the world. So basically, it's not something you're going to use the whole time, but it's another little tool that might be quite handy in your toolbox from time to time. And I suppose what hopefully it's inspiring you to do is to go into to Navionics and other similar products and just have a play around and see what's there. So we're talking about uh, the, the different levels of data. Um, we've obviously got to be careful of uh, rogue data and be aware that it, it does happen. If I um, switch us over to the next slide, uh, we've got an example here, Paul, haven't we? Yeah, so we're back in Pool Harbour on Navionics, um, and we just slid over, and you can just see those two hour islands, and directly south of that island, we're just landing on what looks like some form of lighthouse or structure, um, and we're going to bring up some data about that structure, um, and it will show um, the information there about the fact it's got a fog signal, the fact it's got a light, how high it is. Um, so we've got, you know, in Pool Harbour there, we've got a pretty serious structure. Um, which, given that it's got fog signals and lights, might be a really handy aid to navigation for us. Although it's got to be begged a question as to why in the middle of all that area that dries, we need that in that area, because it looks pretty damn shallow in that area, and would we ever go boating there? So what we'll see in a second um, is we come back um, to the normal screen, and we'll actually just, hopefully if I did this right, um, flick across to the Imre chart for exactly uh, the same area and suddenly you might struggle to see it. And the reason you struggle to see it is it just simply doesn't exist. Um, it's an error on the part of Navionics. Uh, they've put some form of lighthouse in in a place that doesn't exist. Now, you can report that to Navionics, but I suppose the question that begs for me is how many other lighthouses appear on a chart that I might use for navigation that aren't there, uh, or things that should be there that aren't there. Um, and don't overplay that, don't sort of, I, I'm generally pretty, Pretty satisfied with the, the information I'm getting through. But I think hopefully it might just provoke a bit of thought to be just, you know, if we relied solely on that um, structure for our navigation through Pearl Harbor or wherever it is, um, then we could come a cropper. Um, that, if that, we have a robust multi layered approach where that's not critical, uh, then we would pick up the fact that it was an error. Sorry, Tom. Yeah, no, no. I was just going to say that, that yeah, that. Um, uh, follows on nicely really to being careful of our auto routing um, yeah. things because this doesn't take into consideration some factors does it so if I um, I'll press play on this slide and then you can yeah talk, talk us through it so uh, Navionics have a feature called auto routing Garmin have done it for a few years um, and basically see what I'm doing here is just putting a waypoint um, in the middle of the channel at Paul Harbour here um, and then I'm going to scroll all the way over to Limington, um, go up the Limington River and dump another waypoint in the Limington River. Um, and you can see there was a dotted line initially and now it's gone firm and it's worked out according to the draft of my vessel, which I've put into Navionics, where I, should, where I could go. But this bit we stop on in a moment, um, it's taking me quite close to the Shingles Bank and it's taken me through an area of shallower water. And that line I'm just adding in there is the preferred channel if I'm going in that way to the Solon, that's the North Channel. And basically that area south of that um, black line is an area that shallows and takes the energy out of the water. Um, this area here is just off Hennesbury Head and it's a shallower area where it kicks up more. A little bit south of that would have been better. Um, here it's slightly cut corner going in, come quite close to that buoy, uh, which is not a great issue, but I'd be keener to pull away from it a bit. And then as we go in, the route takes me pretty much straight through that buoy. Now, in good conditions, good visibility, I should be able to pick up on those latter two points. But in the context of going across those slightly shallower areas, um, that could just make my passage more lumpy, more challenging, and potentially therefore more dangerous than it needs to be. And I suppose the thing I just urge is a bit of caution in that just because your chart plotter says you can go from Paul to Limington by doing the following, whoa, stop. You need to apply your seamanship, your boating knowledge, your navigation skills to look at that road, route and go, is that right? And I suppose that sort of starts to bring everything together in terms of all that we've covered here, which is there's great resources out there, uh, there's huge amounts of information. But what you need to do as a skipper 
is to be able to work out what's important, uh, what's less important, what we need to be careful of and make some, some educated decisions um, so as to be safe for you and your crew. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's really sound advice. And I think uh, regardless of the, um, uh, the brand that somebody may be using, um, uh, all of the latest tech does, does these features. And I think uh, if we've highlighted, obviously, Navionics and um, featured, you know, Raymarine, Simrad, et cetera, Garmin. Um, but regardless of your, um, your piece of tech that you're using, these pointers can uh, follow across regardless of your platform that's I think really useful things to to think about Absolutely. um so do you want to give us sort of a summary of the key points that we've really covered today paul yeah i think i think in summary it's you know spend it spend a little bit of time on it i appreciate you know for some people the charts the tight side they find really interesting and fascinating for others less so and that's inevitable you know everybody has their passions uh, but having a bit of knowledge um facilitates you potentially going places you otherwise wouldn't go and it keeps you and your family and those that come boating with you safe and and if everybody's safe and they're having more fun they're going to want to go boating more and if you want a bigger boat and a faster boat and you want to buy uh, one of the other boats out of the pages and power boat rib magazine then the happier you make those people that influence the buying decision in your household uh, the more likelihood they are to allow that purchase to go ahead yeah um so we have some questions uh about an hour or two before we went live i, I popped on instagram and, and asked um, people to ask us anything to put your way regarding navigation and, and, and tides. Um, a couple of questions, most of them we, we've covered off on, on what we're going through, but um, with the current amount of tech that we have, um, what's your thoughts on an almanac being obsolete? Do you think it's ob obsolete now or, or is it something that's still useful to have? It depends where you go boating. If you, if you boat Pool Harbour and immediate approaches, no, you don't need an almanac. An almanac is about going other places. If you're going to start going along the coast, then the information an almanac gives you is good. And in paper format, it's a good backup. Uh, I've got the almanac on my uh, iPad. So an almanac is all the tidal information, port and harbour entry information. So it's a repository of information. And they're about £20 a year for your local area. It's the sort of thing to get someone to put on your Christmas present list. Um, so it's worth having, but not unless you're going on passages uh, different places. Yeah. And um, another one, <laughs> who has the right of way at sea? Oh, well, that sounds that, that sounds like a little bit of a trick question, maybe, that someone's trying to try, to try and catch me out on that one. Uh, well, no one has the right of way. And that, that falls in under... Uh, collision regulations and I think that's a session we're going to come to at some point in the future but uh, uh, but pe people can think about you know giving giving way to sail can't they but um, as we were chatting about before going through what we wanted to talk about tonight you brought out that yeah but well, Ben Ainsley can do you know 30 40 knots down the silent you know so where where, where uh, you know some, some of these sailing yachts can now yeah so so basically hours. There's a general rule of thumb that power gives way to sail or vessels under sail. But um, if you're being overtaken, it's the overtaking vessel that gives way. So, and that could be a little fast sailing dinghy or anything, frankly, is that the overtaking vessels give way. So it's a whole different area and it really does merit some discussion because as a as a skipper, you've got a legal responsibility to, to apply the coal regs correctly. And if you don't, you potentially dig yourself a big hole. Yeah. Well, uh, Paul, thank you for all of your time this evening. And uh, thank you to everybody for uh, for watching. Um, PBR, obviously, our, our new motto is to keep boating alive. And so we'll be continuing to do these live sessions and uh, bring you current content, which we really hope is useful to you while you're at home uh, thinking about going boating. And if you are now boating since the regulation change, please make sure that your boat is all safe, that it's technically sound and fit, for, fit to go to sea. Um, but likewise, we also have our free digital edition on uh, powerboatandrib.com. Uh, today has been um, obviously brought to you in partnership with Paul of um, uh, Powerboat Training UK. So if you've got any other further um, uh, questions about um, training, navigation, tides, delving a little bit deeper, then obviously just give Paul a call um, and uh, go from there. But next week we'll be streaming again. Um, with Paul going into um, sort of delving deeper again into navigation, 
We've got a couple of different ideas which we'll be announcing in the week of what we're going to be covering. And uh, we hope that you can join us again. So thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you, Paul, for your time today. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody.